Okay, so you, can you start it? Yeah, it's, it's recording now. Okay, great. All right. Okay, so um, the kettle scripts had, um, you know, were able to load the kind of data that Transparent was initially meant to uh, accommodate and had moderately good performance, um, although load times could be long in the case of studies that have many thousands of patients and or, or many thousands of variables or, you know, some large matrix of those two um, factors. Um, but uh, internally, uh, you know, we are, uh, Clarivate Analytics is a uh, sort of a client-based customer service. Well, we provide knowledge platforms, et cetera, but we also do a lot of service work for um, drug companies and disease-based nonprofits. Um, and although we're platform agnostic, we do do a lot of, we have done a lot of work with Transmart. Um, so we built our own loader uh, tool to optimize, well, to, to basically deal with this, the, issues. We wanted to improve loading performance. Um, um, as many of you who do ETL know, it's often a bit of an iterative procedure where you load data and decide you need to tweak the representation in some way, so you need to knock the study out and reload it. Uh, we wanted to have more flexibility in accommodating a wider variety of particularly high dimensional data types like uh, GWAS data, for example, or metabolomics data from a um, mass spec platform, for example. Uh, we wanted more flexibility in using data values as tree nodes. Um, so um, the, the tree, what I call the tree, the Transmar tree, which is basically our, our ontology, isn't locked up. It's uh, completely flexible. And so you can make it, you can use Transmart to load automotive parts uh, inventories if you wanted to. Um, um, so there's a lot of flexibility in how you generate uh, the knowledge ontology in Transmart, and that means that you have the ability to load very, very, very complicated kinds of data that may require uh, multiple variables to be interpolated in the path that connects the root node of the ontology to, you know, the leaf node of a particular variable. Uh, we wanted to improve how Transmart handled longitudinal data, and we needed better um, reporting of errors and exceptions than was provided by the original um, loader that was released. Uh, those differences aside, the two tools are largely cross-compatible. So anything you, any data files that have been loaded into Transmart with Kettle Scripts, we can load with TM Data Loader. Um, so there's been no divergence of core functionality or approach. There are, in fact, uh, one, two, three. There, there are historically now five different loaders. Uh, a couple of them, like the ICE, this was an attempt to put a, a, um, a graphic user interface. Um, Transmart data is a, a recent uh, growth in the ETL space in Transmart, specifically pitched towards 17.1. Um, Undoubtedly, the kettle scripts that are circulated with distributions of Transmart, TM Data Loader, Transmart Data, and Transmart Batch, these two uh, uh, sort of are generated by the Hive. This one is generated by Clarivate. Uh, these were the original scripts um, distributed by J&J uh, &J with the code base. And this one, IC, has sort of fallen into disuse. Um, it hasn't worked uh, in a while that I'm aware of. So now we only really have four uh, loaders, two of which are um, sort of different aspects of the same procedure, and two of which are general purpose, the kettle scripts and TM data loader. And I'll just, you know, I'm not, uh, although I work for Clarivate, work TM data loader is... Somebody needs to mute. TM Data Loader is, is probably the most widely used tool uh, because it offers the greatest flexibility. Um, at least the two companies that do most of the data loading in North America both rely on TM, TM Data Loader for their work. Um, just a summary of different properties of the loaders. Uh, this is from the uh, Transmart Foundation webpage. Um, if you dig through it, you'll find uh, here are the, 
the sort of four approaches that we've talked about and uh, the different kinds of data that they load. Um, no tool is perfect. Everybody has some, uh, some, something that they don't do yet. Um, as you can see, the variety of uh, omics data that are handled by Transmart is um, not quite comprehensive, I guess, but pretty, pretty broad. Can handle a variety of data types. There are some scaling issues uh, with uh, loading um, SNP data as uh, from VCF files, for example. So loading data, SNP data into tables uh, doesn't seem to um, scale very well, uh, although that's supposed to be uh, um, addressed at, at some point. Okay. So all of the loaders share a number of properties. They all require a core set of files, which are all just flat. They're all, as I said, cross compatible. So they all have the same rough format, which is tab separated flat data files. Um, data files, you can have one or more per data type. So for example, for clinical data, it's not uncommon to have eight or 10 different clinical data files. Perhaps uh, you received your data from um, uh, a SAS study that was C-disk compatible, and so you've got a bunch of C-disk domains and you don't want to mix the data up from different domains. You would make separate data files for each domain. Um, you have a mapping file, uh, one per data type, so a single mapping file per data type. So if you load clinical data and gene expression data, you'll have two mapping files, one for each of the data type. And then um, platform files, which are not needed for clinical data, are used to um, basically provide metadata about high dimensional omics data points. And I'll go through that in a little more detail in a bit. Um, all of the approaches use stored procedures, which are just part of the Transmart installation. So if you load, um, you know, micro RNA, uh, micro uh, RNA uh, seek read counts, uh, the normalization process, which converts counts to Something else is a stored procedure in Transmart that's executed internally. Um, so all the loaders use those procedures, I think, although I think maybe the, uh, the Hive loaders are trying to distance themselves from the procedures and roll those procedures directly into the ETL process. Um, and all of the approaches put an emphasis on significant curation ahead of launching the ETL. So the, the E in ETL, the extract step is typically handled outside of the loader. Um, although there are, each loader has some rudimentary ability to do, for example, to do ver, uh, value substitution during the loading process. If you want to decode data from a dictionary and it's encoded as, you know, one equals male and zero equals female or whatever, then you can do those sorts of simple substitutions from inside the ETL. But, um, but uh, biological data is typically very complicated, complex, and so there's often a lot of uh, pre-processing processing that's done both to uh, make the data adhere to the Transmart ready formats and also to, you know, generate new uh, derivative uh, uh, variable values or consolidate variable values, concatenate variables sometimes, uh, you know, clean data up fix the spelling, uh, rename variable names, etc. cetera. Um, so there's significant pre-curation uh, in the Transmart world. The file formats are really brittle, which means if you don't adhere very strictly to, um, to the, the formats that are required, then, then the loading process uh, breaks. Um, the, the kettle break is, is still pretty inelegant, so it'll just die and you'll get an obscure error code and It'll take quite a bit of work sometimes to figure out why uh, the ETL failed. Um, that's one of the things we tried to improve in uh, in TM Data Loader is um, to basically fix the loading so that it gave you more informative reasons as to why the uh, uh, why the load failed, including a Java dump of you know what was going on during the loading process. And yeah, all of the transport loaders provide pretty flexible data hierarchies. Um, TM data loader specifically, um, files are uh, files that you want to load are structured in a data hierarchy. So what you would prepare is basically a folder 
with the study name and optionally the study ID separated by a, an underscore. And, um, and that folder would contain one or more subfolders. And each subfolder uh, is specific for the, a particular kind of data. So clinical data goes in a folder called clinical data, expression data in a folder called expression data, et cetera. And each of these subfolders contains an, uh, the set of files that are required to load the data. So if it's a clinical data folder, you'll have a single mapping file and one or more uh, clinical data files. The names of the clinical data files need to correspond to the names that are found in the mapping file. And uh, each row, each column in the clinical data file corresponds to a row in the mapping file. And I'll show you what that looks like. Um, expression data loading has, uh, is similar. You have a data file, you have a mapping file. You also need to include a platform file. And that's true for most of the omics data. They, they all follow the same sort of file naming schema and this triplet of files that are required. A data file, um, a mapping file, and a platform file. Um, one exception is a GWAS data, which comes as a, a binary triplet of files, typically. Uh, the FAM and BIM files are actually not binary, but um, the BED file is. This is where the actual uh, GWAS data is uh, encoded in binary format. This triplet is just named and uh, a mapping file, simple mapping files uh, created to map that to the, the hierarchy and the transmart tree. So just some examples of different files. These are uh, 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 clinical data files. Uh, I've coded in yellow here uh, what I call um, service variables. So the study ID and subject ID are required for every line. And um, generally, you'll have one line per subject. Um, but you know, you see here in this file, that's violated because we have multiple visits, which is also a service variable. And so uh, in this file, we have one line per subject per visit. In some uh, data files, we also will have uh, variables, like, for example, this progressor group or the side variable. Um, these are variables with values. We can use these values as nodes in a tree so, um, so that all the data uh, in the remainder of this row loads into a tree that has a node that differentiates right from left. Um, I'll, I'll show you how that happens. Uh, so these, two, um, these are two separate files. Uh, there are two different data files. They're in separate files because some of the data values are broken down by visit and some of the data values are not. This is um, a part of the mapping file that corresponds to uh, those data files that I just showed you. And again, I've colored the, the three variables from the second file here in yellow and the two variables from the first one in yellow. And um, so we specify the file name that the variable was the, the, that contains the data in the first column. In the second column, we code the uh, category code. So this is basically the path in the, the transmart tree where values that correspond to the data label are going to be stored. And then the column number refers to um, the, uh, the column, the ordinal column numbers from the data file, right? So one, two, three, four, the fifth one is the JSL and pain. Um, I also, if I go down here, one, two, three, four, five, there it is, GSL and pain progressor. So, so that means that these values are loading into the path study groups. All right, so in the, yeah, so in the clinical data mapping file, we actually have eight different columns that are defined in our TM data loader specifications. Again, the first is the file name, the second is the category code, the third refers to the column in the data file, the fourth re refers to what you want to call the node where that data is gonna land, um, and five through eight have um, are more specific to use cases that I'll get to in a minute. Some of these brand 
branches are hard coded. All the ones that are shown here are are hard coded. So we define this path manually by, uh, you know, figuring out what we want the ontology to look like. A lot of this is data driven typically, um, because uh, we deal with a lot of different kinds of data, including preclinical data from animal studies and things like that. So we need a lot of flexibility to define this ontology. And as I said, some of the branches um, in here, none of the ones shown, but I'll show you some in a minute, can be variables with uh, the values of which are derived from a data file. All right, so here's an example where I show you two different ways to uh, load variables. Um, the first one was distributed with the kettle scripts. So in addition to the same three uh, yellow variables that I showed you before, the study, the service variable, study name, subject name, and visit name, I have a fourth service variable called uh, data label. And this is a generic label to, to indicate that the, the, um, the data in the fourth column of the, this particular file is going to be used as a variable. And you have to put into the path that you're creating the word data label where you want that variable to interpolate. And, um, and that's the, that, that was the distribution from Kettle. There was basically, you were allowed to use a single variable interpolation in your path to take values from a data file and uh, you know, create a bifurcation or a branch point in the Transmart tree. Uh, we didn't find that sufficient, so we added a new um, a new form of variable interpolation that we call tags, and that's this double dollar sign value. It's double dollar sign in front of a text string, all caps, and that text string is defined in the data label. You can have an infinite number of these, so you can create a, an arbitrarily complex tree using multiple variables that are interpolated into that tree to create a very uh, deep and rich hierarchy. Um, in this particular example, I'm using both the data label nomenclature and the biomarker nomen or the tag nomenclature in the same tree. And I'll just jump out of Transmart and show you what that looks like in a second. Um, and down here, oops, I didn't do this right. I should have uh, substituted data label for dollar dollar tissue. I, I just wanted to show you that you don't know. Oh, this, or I should have just deleted data label here actually and just added tissue. So I didn't delete data label, I should have, because there's no longer a data label here. But these are both functionally equivalent. I'm just showing you that here we're using the kettle approach to interpolation and our tag approach to interpol interpolation in the same file. Whenever you use the data label interp interpolation, you need to use this data label source column over here where you specify the column number from the file that's being used to interpolate the data. And there's a, a second a, a letter here, which could be A or B, depending on where you want the interpolation to occur exactly, before or after the data label. B is the default and it goes before. Um, also, you'll notice that the, very, that the data label names have been stuck into the path. Um, because we're, uh, we, we use a slash here to indicate that the ETL should look in the next column to find out where to put a data label here. So it, it basically reads values from the, the fourth column and puts them in here on a subject by subject basis or a row by row basis, and then reads that value into the path wherever you choose to put the word data label. And then down here, we're using uh, two tags rather than the kettle um, approach. Um, the, the, uh, the names that the, the text string that you type is arbitrary, but it needs to match something in the data label uh, column. So really quickly, let me just jump over to here.
Okay. All right. So what I'm going to show you now is just the uh, the loaded files which correspond to the um, the two data sets that I've been talking about, or the, the the examples that I've been talking about. Here we go. Okay, so for example, um, these are both the same data set. They're just represented in different ways. So the paths are basically the same. Clinical data, laboratory test results, um, biomarker tissue or tissue biomarker, depending on which way it was loaded. laboratory test results. So here we loaded the tissue, and here you can see serum and urine. If I go to the actual data file, here are the values for tissue, serum and urine. So these are laboratory tests from two different fluids, and this is the name of the biomarker which was being interrogated in a particular laboratory test. And so even if I filter this by say, just look at urine, you still find, you know, a subset. And if I filter by serum, you find the same subset. So the same biomarkers were detected in two different fluids. And so the way we load this is within the study, uh, we stuck it in clinical data, laboratory test results broken down by serum or um, urine. And so the, the tests that were done split in the tree by, um, by tissue. And then a number of measures can be loaded beneath that. And in this case, you know, there were eight or 10 different measures, the most significant of which is the interpolated research value, which is what, uh, which is basically the numeric value. And since there are multiple visits, that shows up as well. So what I can do is just make a cohort. And then look at the data. And if I look at uh, V1 of uh, the urine test for C1C2 and compare that to the serum test for C1C2, you know the values are different. You know, this is our serum, this is our urine. You're looking at the same biomarker in both. So that would be hard to load without variable interpolation. Um, you would really have to make a very, very wide data file where basically all these measures would be repeated twice, once for serum, once for urine, and then each of those would have to be repeated eight or 10 times, once for each blood test. So the data file can get very large. So this provides a, a much more compact way to do curation because you can basically stack everything into a long format and then just curate the contents of the column once rather than having to do many dozens of columns for each variable. As I said, there were eight columns that are defined. Um, column one is our file name reference, column two category code. Three is the column number in the data file. Four is the data label. Five is the data label source, which we use when with the kettle data label functionality. Six, seven, and eight are um, specific. Uh, six is when you're loading timestamp data, you can define a baseline. Um, baseline may, may be different across different subjects. Like if, uh, um, and, and so you don't always necessarily want to load the same um, uh, values as baseline across all different subjects, so we can define baseline. Um, variable type uh, is an optional uh, variable. Uh, the ETL does a pretty good job of guessing the variable type, um, but if you want to be explicit about it, you can be. And then we have this column, which are validation rules. 
which will uh, only load data that fits um, a set of validation rules that are semicolon delimited. So if you only want to load ages between uh, 0 and 89, for example, to comply with uh, um, HIPAA requirements, you can have in the original data set uh, values above 89, but only load values up to 89 into the Transmart instance, for example. Non-clinical data, um, we have, uh, as like I said, it's slightly different requires three files, three file types, the data file. This is a sample of gene expression data file. Uh, this has clearly been normalized already. Um, it's loaded as a matrix where uh, the contents of the first column are the spot identifiers from, in this case, the Illumina array. And uh, sample identifiers are loaded in, in columns. And so, the intersection of column and row is the value of this particular spot in this particular sample. Uh, in addition, you need a subject sample mapping file. This basically maps the uh, sample identifiers from the previous slide to the subject identifiers. Often that's trivial if there's only one sample per subject, but if there are technical replicates or if you have samples from you know, different tissues, you may have, uh, for example, uh, from a biopsy, you may take a, a, a a tumor biopsy with a contralateral control sample. So you may have multiple samples from a similar subject, and then you'd have to differentiate those by specifying in ATTR1, attribute one or attribute two are, are basically free variables that allow you to differentiate um, subpopulations of the high dimensional data that you're loading. Um, the platform is specified, right? The name of the platform that was used to gather the data and again, the category code, much like the clinical data here, you can hard code or soft code um, a path where the data will reside. And it's in Transmart, typically in a um, uh, biomarker hierarchy. So the function of this file is both to connect the high dimensional data to the clinical subject ID through the subject sample mapping, but also to mark, map the biomarker to the tree. And then finally, the platform file you've heard me talking about is basically a way to provide metadata for spot IDs that are present in the first column, for example, of this data file. So, you know, the Illumina identifier refers to a particular gene symbol with an entree gene ID and a name and a species. You know, and Transmart is sensitive to all of these uh, variables and can provide contextual information for spot identifiers. So, for example, even though the identifiers in the data file are the Illumina numbers, when you run an analysis and you want to, you know, do a, um, maybe a, you've, you generate a differentially expressed gene list and you do a, a marker selection workflow or something like that, and then you want to do pathway enrichment, well, the Illumina numbers aren't going to work for pathway enrichment. You need to convert those into, you know, gene names or entree gene IDs. Um, then run the pathway enrichment using a tool like Metacore or, or, or some other tool. Um, so all of that happens inside Transmart because we provide that information in the platform file for the high dimensional data. Okay, um, that was sort of a summary of um, the main features. I will say we have a wiki uh, for, where is it? We have a wiki for the loader. Um, it's really detailed. Um, so for example, if we look at the clinical data page for loading, it tells you how to structure your data. It gives you uh, samples of files so that you can you know, have a real template to work from. Um, it specifies you know, what all the, the, the columns, for example, of the mapping file are. Um, if there are any, there are three uh, Transmart specific uh, controlled terminologies that you need to use in order to get summary statistics in Transmart. It tells you what you can do with those. Tell, it talks about data label, how to code the category CD, which is the the um, the path. Basically, it's a plus sign delimited set of hierarchies. Um, 
tells you how to handle special use. So we have some special symbols that provide special functionality in the path. Um, tags, so this description of variable interpolation and how it works is gone through in great detail. Uh, the ETL provides various merge modes. So rather than reload a study completely, uh, the ETL understands in the mapping file, you can add a line that specifies whether you're replacing a subset of data, if you're updating certain variables or updating information on subjects, or if you're appending a new data set to an existing data set. Um, the ETL can also uh, move variables or subsets of variables within a study and can move studies within to different sort of parental nodes inside the tree. Uh, we have special uh, consideration for handling uh, serial um, uh, clinical data, so basically time-stamped information or time-date stamped, and the ETL is smart about parsing a variety of formats, so it can read timestamps or it can read things like, like one hour, 30 minutes, or baseline, like it, it has a pretty good under, understanding of how to parse information into real time and then provide a, for example, if you do a, a line graph, where you're graphing time points on the x-axis, it'll provide real distances between time points that are proportional to elapsed common units. Um, and yeah, there's lots more information that I, I won't go through. And then it goes through how to load you know, each of the use cases um, for specific uh, high dimensional data. I talked about gene expression data already. If we just look at the proteomics page, it'll look quite similar. Um, it gives you an example of proteomics data, shows you what file format um, it expects. Um, there are flags that you can place uh, in the, the name of the file that, um, that are parsed. So the, the, the file names that, um, where, where is it? Let me go back to the clinical example here. The file names have to study, uh, sorry, have to follow a very um, rigid naming scheme because our loader actually parses the file name to get information, for example, on the study name and what have you. And in the case of uh, gene expression data or proteomics data, the file name also contains a variable for data type. And that refers to whether or not the data is being loaded as raw, unnormalized, untransformed data or if it's being normalized and or, you know, log transformed or converted to Z-score domains. Um, uh, and stored procedures are used to take that data that's input where you specified the data type and do the conversion internally to load it into the appropriate data tables. Uh, the same is true for proteomics data. So here's our file format. And then it specifies how the platform needs to look. You know, it's got a header with required fields, and then it's got a, the body of the tab delimited file needs to contain four columns with the following names, et cetera. Again, um, just to emphasize uh, why we do all of this, uh, it's because everybody who uses Transmart, all files are portable between instances. So um, there aren't sort of location specific quirks to the structure of the underlying data. And I think that's, um, you know, one of the key uh, um, attractions for me as somebody who loads data for organizations professionally, um, knowing that um, if I generate a data set, I can distribute it to the organization. And, um, and if it's a public data set, we can make it once. And no matter who wants to load it, they can, they can load the same files that we created once, regardless of what ETL they use. Okay, um, I guess I'll stop there. Uh, if anybody has any questions they want to jump in and ask about that, that would be, uh, I'd be happy to, to address anything. Hey, this is Mike. Uh, so all of the uh, data files and um, the application and everything is on that uh, GitHub site? Yep. Okay, great. The, um, the GitHub site is just GitHub Clarivate LSPS TM Data Loader. And it's in the, the slides that I 
um, I can send the slides off to anybody who wants them and uh, the link is there. Okay, great, thank you. Yes, that was uh, very helpful and useful. Uh... I guess my question is to what extent is my impression that the I2B2 ETL procedures are much more um, diverse, that the ecosystem is much more sort of uh, location specific. Is it really true that most folks are using sort of homegrown procedures for loading data or do you, is there a, a standard emerging on the I2B2 uh, side? So it's mainly homegrown stuff. Uh, and then typically, so typically when we load ITB2 data, it's usually like diagnosis like ICD-9, ICD-10 codes, uh, procedures, same type of things. Uh, and then you have like medication in a lab. So it's usually like, so I see in your transpond, you can have one line that has multiple values. And then, so if I had like four columns in it, then there would be four entries. The TM data loader looks like it will take that one line and convert it into four entries in the observations act. Yeah. Um, so in the ITB2 world, it's usually a one-to-one. -one. So I'm trying to think of scenarios. I mean, I guess you could have medications that have like the route dose uh, as a different column, and then something like the TM data loader would be useful in that sense that it would then take those and put them as modifiers or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah, but where we find, so, yep. uh, I was gonna say, typically where we find that functionality is most useful in clinical data is um, in the adverse events hierarchies. Um, you, you, you know, some organizations are interested in adverse events that are indexed by severity. They only want to see the severe events. They may that may trigger some reporting requirement um, in a drug drug trial, for example. Uh, others are more like the clinical side of it may be more interested in adverse events indexed by um, tissue or you know if you're a neurologist, you're only caring maybe about tissues that affect behavior because of neurological changes. Uh, whereas somebody who's a gastroenterologist might be looking for, you know, nausea and so different kinds of adverse events. Um, so that and uh, laboratory tests, the example I showed where, you know, you do, you, you maybe multiple biopsies have been taken, CSF, uh, um, um, blood, serum, uh, different serum fractions perhaps, and or urine, uh, um, and they're measuring things in different tissues. Uh, you, you know, in, in that situation, like a CDC panel, for example, and a urinalysis that's typically ordered by a physician when somebody has some sort of event in an ER, that data would be easy to load in Transmark because you could split it up by biopsy type and then further split it up by the, the biomarker, which is being assessed, or the test type, like the, you know, uh, liver function tests like AST and such, and separate those from the CBC blood count. Um, so those kinds of hierarchies uh, benefit a lot from being able to stack data into a long format. Again, from the data handling side, the advantage is that you only have to call, curate one column of data. Like I've got, I could show you a, 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 a laboratory test file that is only four columns wide, but it's, you know, 900,000 rows. And it's not that there are a lot of subjects in that trial. There's maybe a thousand subjects in that, but there are multiple visits and there are multiple uh, blood tests that are being performed on every subject, maybe a hundred different blood tests. Um, but there's really only one column to curate. There's only one column where you have to make sure all the values are numeric or um, categorical as appropriate. Because all the, the, the all of the values are stacked <laughs> and separated by visit and, and test type and tissue. Right, yeah. So, yeah, so that makes sense. Um, okay. This is Griffin. Um, I haven't done Transmart load, but I've done a lot of ITB2 loads. And a lot of times with ITB2, you sort of load what you have into the fact table, and then you deal with the messiness in the ontology. So, you know, 
your white blood cell count, but inside of that folder, you have the 100 different codes uh, your institution uses for it. Um, and as a result, there's often a lot of stuff in my ICD-2 that isn't even queryable because it doesn't map to something that's inside of the ontology. Um, another thing is that uh, I'm, usually I'm not loading data from a data file. It's usually transferring data from one data warehouse into an ITB2 repository. So it's, um, it's database sort of scripts rather than um, uh, loading up the CSV plot file and parsing that. It's an engine transmart, you're doing a lot of the cleanup ahead of time, and then what you load in is a very curated file. And I know that what I'm loading into my SAC table, there's a whole bunch of nice to there's a whole bunch of stuff there, which is just junk or meaningless things that users can't even access because it's not to an ontology. Hmm. Yeah, so the 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 um the advantage well the an advantage uh, the the approach in Transmart is you know you you put your curated files in a particular location on the application server that's running Transmart and anybody who has access to that instance can can go in and FTP out the the curated data files and move them to another instance and invoke a loader there um, so it's an, it, it would be kind of unusual, I guess, to try and uh, duplicate a study through an SQL dump or something, or getting getting uh, like using the SQL commands directly. Like the TM data loader is doing all of that in the background. If you if you watch, you can you can turn on verbose logging and and watch what TM data loader is doing. It's just running piles of SQL code. It's all just embedded in the tool. So the actual invocation is a single line, right? So this is, um, let's see. Yeah. You just, uh, you put your data in the right, right right spot and you type this and it'll load a secure version of the study into Transmart. And there are some like options if you wanna make a log file or whatever, but you don't have to actually invoke any SQL code yourself. Oh, do you wanna present something? It's a You mean like an example? Oh, uh, no, I wasn't sure if you were trying to uh, present something. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I turned off sharing, didn't I? <laughs> Apologies here. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. There we go. Right. So the invocation is, is literally, it's a Java jar file. So you just invoke the jar file and and uh, you give it flags, okay? And the, there are a variety of flags that you know are described in the TM data loader PDF. Well, we just that's I think it's probably linked here or somewhere. If it isn't, we definitely will link it. But the PDF just outlines what the flags do. So this particular flag obviously loads the data with the security enabled, so that you can specify users and/or groups that have access to this study. But it's dead simple. Java, you know, you just invoke the jar file. And what it does is it, it looks in its um, data repository internally, not the SQL tables, but where I tr transfer the curated data files. It checks the study name. And if that study is already loaded, it passes it by. Well, actually, what happens is it loads everything that it finds, except anything that's prefixed with um, uh, a particular text string. And then after the files have been loaded, the loader actually alters the name of the file to include that text prefix. So on subsequent invocations, it doesn't try to reload the same data. Um, so all of the loaded data files on Transmart are present in the SQL tables, but they're also present in um, a flat text tab to limited format in a folder on the Transmart application server. And if you want to put them on your instance and you have access to both servers, you just FTP the file hierarchy out and put the files that you're interested in loading on your server and then just invoke the loader and go home for the night and it'll load everything for you. So this, this process, it's very easy to train someone how to do this. Once, as long as you can provide curated data files 
anybody can do ETL loading on Transmart. You don't need a, a, a specific person trained to do this. Although I suppose it's handy to have one around in case something goes wrong. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this. This is very useful. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so this was kind of what we were talking, thinking about, some way of, uh, so Transmod looks like it has a robust way of loading data in. Uh, we were looking at trying to develop a similar type of thing for ITB2. Um, I know there was some stuff I was supposed to do over the last month, which I regret that I didn't do. So I would do that this month, and that included like creating a document for the preloading for the ETL, basically kind of what you need, stuff like that. And then there was going to be some like text of stored, uh, using stored SQL stored procedures to do some, some validation. And we were just going to start to create some of those. So I will do that uh, within the next week or so. And then I'll email that out to the group. Uh, and then we can have a discussion through email and then Next month, we can talk about some of those uh, that we've gone through over the last month through emails. Um, is there anything else that um, we want to talk about in this meeting? Okay, I take that. Okay, so like I said, I will uh, do my homework and get that done. Uh, Steve, thank you very much for this. This is uh, excellent. And can you send me the slides, and then I'll post the slides and the video, or the WebEx uh, portion of it, on the uh, wiki site so that other people can benefit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, the only thing, the only thing I'd add is to, to what you've said is we're very likely to be porting TM data loader to, you know, whatever Transmart I2B2 hybrid um, is going to be used in the wilderness because as a service organization, we need to be able to load data into everything, basically. Um, right. And, uh, and so this is going to happen on our side as well. So we should definitely be talking to you about, you know, what you find. Yeah. Uh, so, what you find about you need? Because, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, how does it scale with like terabytes of data? Terabytes? Yeah. Did you say terabytes of data? Well, I mean, yeah. it depends. If you've, I, I've loaded studies. I mean, I, gosh, I'm trying to think of the largest. Study I've loaded. When you start talking about terabytes of data, you're usually talking about sequence data. Um, so you that terabytes of data. It depends on the data type, I guess. If you're asking how the loader scales, um, it it does a high dimensional data. The procedures are. It's been pretty optimized. For loading high dimensional data and you can the problem though is that the very largest data sets that we see typically have a lot of vcf files and transmart as a platform doesn't scale well with uh, vcf files um, you know the the sort of direction that transmart's taken from the hive into 17.1 sort of separates the loading of variant information it basically pulls it out of transmart and drops it onto another platform which is specific for loading variant data which i think they plan to use arvados for that um, and then just provide ways to invoke an arvados workflow flow from inside transmart um, probably the biggest set of files that i've loaded is well, i mean i've loaded many gigabytes of gene expression data but not terabytes of expression data and certainly not terabytes of clinical data. So I can't answer your question. I'm not sure what scaling is like at the terabyte scale. Okay, yeah. I mean, 
So I've done like, uh, so I could be too using like some of the SQL lo uh, server loaders. We were able to load like billions of observation facts from millions of patients. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, but then we also tried to start working on VCF files also. And we were trying to load VCF files into SQL Server. And we were starting to run mm -hmm. into issues around 30,000 patients. Uh, yeah. At that point, it's a 34 billion records in the observation fact. Uh, and so SQL Server itself had issues scaling to that amount. Um, and then yeah. trying to create a standardized indexing. That's the other aspect. So you know, I mean, yep. I, I was just going to say, in the, the sequencing world, like in the world of folks who don't really care about clinical data platforms at all, they just generate large amounts of sequence data institutes like the Broad and the Whitehead and others, Sanger, uh, they've come to the conclusion that SQL storage of sequencing information is just a, a sort of a non-starter for those reasons. And everyone's using, you know, very specific uh, data storage platforms that are optimized for handling huge amounts of variant data. Right, yeah. So I think uh, not part of the ETL group, but in the future, it might be that ITB2, if it wants to do this type of sequencing, would just uh, connect up to some other type of database for that type of work. That seems and, sensible. And not try to load into it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I, like, I, I don't know how hard it was tried to optimize to try and fix the optimization problems that we began to encounter in the Transmart world with scaling variant data, but um, it, it became, you know, it, it, it basically made it so nobody was using uh, Transmart to, to handle variant data because very large amounts of it were causing all sorts of performance problems, both on the loader side and on the application side. Right, yeah. So, yeah, because I did some work a while ago on uh, modifying ITB2 to connect to a fire instance. So I could see that that type of work could be re-engineered re for uh, the VCF files. So. But I think it's almost one o'clock now. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Thank you, Steve, for the presentation. It was excellent. I will post that on the website. And like I said, I will do my homework this week and send the homework I should have done uh, earlier uh, this week. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, Bye. and have a good day. Thanks. Bye. Yep. Bye. Bye.